So, hi, I'm Jim Shine. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here to speak a little bit for the San Francisco Historical Society, uh, creating a Zoom presentation of a subject matter that's dear to me, San Francisco. Uh, I'm uh, going to take advantage of technology uh, and uh, show about a dozen maps and or views of the city over a small period of time. We'll do it in kind of an archaic analog way. Uh, you can see them uh, at the top of my screen here. Uh, I'm starting, in fact, with uh, an image on my screen, which is a painting uh, in my possession. Uh, that is a painting uh, taken of the Lagoon Survey. And this would be uh, looking out at the Golden Gate across uh, Fort Mason and the Marina to the Golden Gate from approximately Filbert and Van Ness. Uh, and I started with this because um, here we have the waterfront that would be the Marina District and Chrissy Field would be about out here, uh, all landfill. We have uh, white sand dunes here. This was known as Cape Blanco, uh, White Point or the White Cape. We call it Black Point or Fort Mason. Point San Jose it actually has several names, but it's the end of Van Ness Avenue and where Van Ness connects to the bay. And a good landmark, one that's visible from well outside of the Golden Gate and from all points within uh, of promontory within the city. Uh, this view uh, is just super special to me, uh, one, because uh, of its age and its time frame, but also because it shows something that's uh, difficult for me to imagine. And part of it is what did San Francisco and the area outlined uh, that we still what we call San Francisco today, but at that time would have been the, the Western edition and the, uh, the the suburbs of the Western development to come. Uh, what did these areas look like and feel like? And this painting gave me uh, a great sense in that I uh, recognized the painting re um, immediately upon seeing it, as I've seen photographs of this area, um, and I wanted to take the first maybe five or 10 minutes of our discussion, uh, looking at both this painting and some of the things that kind of uh, impact then our interpretation of maps and what they mean as we come down into pioneer California and pioneer San Francisco. This uh, is a view, as I mentioned, looking west, uh, northwest out the Golden Gate uh, with the Marin Headlands in the background. Uh, Fort Points would be about here. Uh, this is Fort Mason or Black Point here. Um, this is uh, the home of uh, one of the recipients of uh, the Lagoon Survey. The Lagoon Survey being an odd survey, which we'll talk about in a few moments. And the reason that I really love this piece is that it shows um, trails and roads, uh, but it shows trails and roads that are significant. Not just a trail and a road, but in fact, the Presidio Road off here to the left and what would become essentially Van Ness Avenue down here to the right. And these two roads are significant in their development of the city of San Francisco and the expansion both north from Market Street to the Bay and uh, indeed uh, from Van Ness West out to the Presidio and beyond. Um, so uh, these are a couple of interesting roads that have great history, the Presidio Road uh, being demarked early on, it had one of the first water projects on it. Uh, Spring Valley Water Company's first venture was to uh, explore and bring water from the Presidio Lake and from Pillar Cedars Creek a little further south uh, via flume, via a uh, wooden uh, pipe uh, along parallel to this road to bring it to this area to store it in what in fact are lagoons. Uh, right down here, is one lake and right over here uh, is a dry addition of another larger lake um, and the color kind of shows us that it's dry um, giving us a little clue to perhaps the time of year uh, that this is uh, being uh, much drier than say spring and perhaps midsummer or, or even later uh, but we see that these roads are simply textured paths they are uh, a sandy uh, landscape uh, with lots of alluvial sand um, blowing and washing everywhere, uh, sea grasses and some scrub. This here is why we call this point Black Point. In that fact, these are black willow trees. Uh, and these were just as visible from maritime view as the white point of the sands were. And so we used these willows, and this is also a sand dune field, which essentially would run on Lombard Street today. 
uh, Lombard would have been a 60 to 20 foot high sand dune field uh, running along its course with, uh, with lakes and small ponds along it from uh, waters flowing out from Pacific Heights uh, to the north uh, down towards the bay. And this was a, a private outside of the city landscape outside of the proper uh, definition of San Francisco at the time. Uh, this was the Western uh, lands, which were subject to the Homestead Act and available for squatters. Uh, if they uh, made improvements, put up a fence, uh, got water, put in a house, et cetera, et cetera. So it's uh, the Wild West, to say the least, but it's also a, a natural landscape that I have rarely had the opportunity to really see in a virgin form, in a presentation of sincerity like this. Uh, many times we see images of landscapes and they're uh, either dramatized or they've been uh, simplified for the promotion of the city. So with that, we get the texture of what a road and a trail feels like. And I, I just want us to look at that and kind of get a feel for that because as we go in and start looking at maps, I'm gonna open uh, first uh, a La Perouse map from 1798. This would be the first a non-Spanish map of the San Francisco Bay, produced by the French in uh, 1788 and released for public review in 1798. Uh, so it has information and it's a rather abstract map. It's very difficult to tell. I've got it oriented this way uh, so that west is to the left and north is at the top as we are often familiar with maps being. Um, but in fact, the norm for this map is is a little bit different orientation. Uh, but with that, here are the Farallon Islands, and here we come in the Golden Gate, and this would be uh, Fort Point, and this would be Angel Island and Alcatraz. Um, and we see watersheds. Uh, I'm gonna blow this up just a little bit. Uh, and we can see uh, watersheds. This would be the lake that would be out at Lake District and Lake Street. Um, we see creeks feeding in. Uh, we see water uh, above uh, and near the Yerba Buena Cove. We see Mission Bay, in fact, and we see the Mission. Um, these are all indicated at a legend here, uh, which gives us a lot of information. And here as well, when we see D and E, E is in fact listed as uh, Punta de Canai Blanco. And that would be these sand dunes right over here. So here's a French map from 1798, uh, pointing out the landmark of these dunes that we see here in a painting from 1854. Uh, so there's nice continuity for us to get an idea of placement and the accuracy of this map. When we blow this up a little bit further and go into the city, we see the French have been moving around and they're interested in water. Um, so we have all of the aquifers that are viable in the creeks. And then we see that Lake Merced, in fact, at this time is estuarial and subsequently could be brackish and not palatable uh, and usable for storage. Remember in your six or 10,000 miles sail from home, uh, you wanna find provisions and you're also in foreign territory, you're in Spain. Um, so, uh, but we see some very familiar and a very accurate and good definition of the city of San Francisco and its landmarks as we will continue to see them and we go along and we see the name Cape Blanco applied to E uh, from the beginning, and so that's nice. I thought it would be nice to uh, familiarize us a bit with Eddie's map of the city. Uh, and this map <clears throat> is the formal plan. Uh, this map was filed with the federal government in 1849. It was uh, commissioned by William Eddie. The surveying uh, was done by o Jasper O'Farrell. Uh, O'Farrell did three surveys of the city uh, that is to say there are three definitively different surveys done on different scale for different functions or reasoning. Um, so we have the uh, 50 Vara survey, which is the uh, north of Market, uh, east of Van Ness. Um, we have the 100 Vara survey, which is essentially south of Market. We have the water lot survey, which is these um, to be filled lands, all right, first city to plan to actually fill in the water and put in land lots, and we did so, and this will precipitate some of the things that will happen here in the future. Um, so here's our original city plan, and then out here, the fourth survey is in fact the Lagoon Survey, uh, 2,600 bar lots that have been assigned through uh, the uh, process of land grants to the early and first American alcades, uh, mayors of San Francisco in the 1848 to 49 period, and uh, 
people like uh, J.D. Stevenson of Stevenson's Volunteers, New York Regiment of Volunteers who uh, performed on behalf of Polk to attain California on behalf of the Americans. Um, he had attained uh, Lot 24 and 14 here. Um, so there is some uh, history known with the Lagoon Survey, but it's pretty cryptic. And in fact, our view on the screen is of the Lagoon Survey and that point in the promontory we're standing is right about here, looking out to the Northwest. So here's our starting point with San Francisco. We have a few existing surveys that have been commissioned. We have some land grants enumerated here, the green circle, the yellow, excuse me, green square, the yellow rectangle. There's a pink rectangle in here as well somewhere. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, those are land grants and lands that were owned by others prior to the creation of this official map of San Francisco. This is what was filed by Eddie with the federal government through the state in 1849, and that ultimately was filed in Oregon City as a fed, our only federal office at the time. And uh, for years, San Francisco was asked to get that map back, but it remains at the federal office in which it was filed. Um, so with the filling on the creation of water lots, this is a new concept. Um, we need flat land. All of this land is hilly. Um, all of this land is undeveloped uh, to this degree. So when we go in and look at um, Eddie's map, we realize that it's uh, a process of intentionally filling in the bay. And so I grabbed this somewhat unusual uh, panorama from Albert Dressler's collection. It's a uh, 1851 panorama. It's a, actually a seven panel, but I've trimmed off the two other panels to the right uh, as they are simply more vessels. Um, and I really just wanted to reinforce the point. We're standing on Rincon Point, a point that essentially uh, is where the Bay Bridge connects to San Francisco. And we're looking north across what was Yerba Buena Cove. And Yerba Buena Cove in the 1850s is being sold off as water lots and it is being developed as per William Eddy's plan of 1849. And this process entails, um, in many cases, bringing in uh, these vessels which have been abandoned uh, by their crews who've gone off to the gold fields and captains who can't raise a crew. Uh, and so in many cases, these uh, vessels are either mothballed or abandoned. And it's a well-known story of the creation of land but here's a marvelous image that really gives us a in the moment snapshot that as we look across its field of scope, we see a great number of variety of uh, states of affair. What I mean is that these vessels out here to the right are still active. They're out in, in good water um, and they can light off with smaller vessels and they can get in and out. Um, as we get in further and further, we see a greater level of uh, sedentation and decay and greater impact by the flow and ebbs of tides as they go in and out. And by the time we get here, we start to see what in fact are water lots. These are the 25 by 125 foot lots as they have been prescribed in Eddie's plan and sold off by the city to independent parties for development. And in many cases, you would go in and survey to mark it off and then go dump a bunch of stuff in there and create your island. Or you might just wait until your neighbors filled in around you, at which point it might be easier for you to fill in. And you might speculate and sell this before you even got that job done. Here we see a vessel which has been placed on its lot and it is being now used as a store ship, a warehouse, a brig. Um, ships uh, like the Apollo, our first uh, uh, jail, uh, were uh, like this. There's also uh, a couple of hotels um, that uh, started out this history and they wound up on, uh, on Sansa McClay Street uh, and were uh, really rather famous. Um, I believe that's a little bit further up and we're probably just at Market Street right about here. This is south of Market and the Iron District that would become uh, off of Second Street. Uh, this being approximately Fremont Street here with Telegraph Hill due north, Angel Island just behind it to the right, um, Russian Hill and Knob Hill. Um, and so we see uh, across this bay, uh, gradually filling up with water lots being filled in, with vessels coming in, and with the creation of land. Well, with that creation of land, we have all kinds of challenges. And uh, we kind of take it on ad hoc. 
Uh, and what I mean by that is that these things are happening in the independence of an individual and their own motivation and the skills uh, that they have to make land uh, by dumping sand and debris and garbage in these water lots. This process is fairly laborious. One man, one wheelbarrow, one load, and, and thousands of cubic yards to fill a 25 by 125 foot lot that's as much as 10 or 12 feet deep in water, and then another five feet to be above grade. Um, but we see in fact by 1853, in the first official American survey, um, this is <clears throat> truly the first map of the city by the Americans as a government. It's done by the US Coast Survey under A.D. Bash. Uh, Bash is a very, very successful um, both tactician, as well as a surveyor, as well as a diplomat in that um, the USCS was funded in 1805 or created by Thomas Jefferson, but never uh, properly funded until 1840s uh, and really mismanaged up until Bash stepped in in 1842. And from that point on, uh, the US Coast Survey started to document the development of the American coastline, our claims of dominion. And cities like New York and Boston and San Francisco, LA, San Diego, fell right into the uh, need for those documentations as our new claims of dominion and new cities as they grew. So in the case of San Francisco, we have what is essentially the first map of the city. And I've, I've left it um, open uh, in general terms. That is to say, we haven't closed up on it yet. I'm going to click in, but I wanted to, this is the map that really starts to make the discussion about uh, how San Francisco developed and how you got around. Uh, because this map explains to us that uh, first the, the edge of town in 1853 is, is basically Mason or Taylor Street, um, the hills of Knob Hill and Russian Hill uh, prevents uh, any westward growth here very much. Here's the lagoon survey that we pointed out in the houses. My painting uh, as in the screensaver is taken from right about here looking this direction again. Um, and then we have Market Street delined but or denoted but not really visible. And what we do see when we come in here is that we have sand dunes here that range from 20 to 80 feet high. And specifically at Third Street, it comes up and runs right into an 80-foot sand dune. And this is one of the greater impacts on travel in San Francisco. And that is that it is an undulating dune field of rock outcroppings and sand, constantly changing and constantly under erosion and the threat of wind and tides. And it's really pretty exposed. It's not a very hospitable place to live, frankly. Um, so when we look at uh, a map like this, uh, we'll close in a little bit on it and we'll start to notice a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, here's Yerba Buena Cove, as we saw, and in the photograph we were standing here, looking across this direction to the north, northwest, um, and we're looking at the steel yards that were over here, we're looking at all the vessels that are out here, and, and the water lots that were just here in the foreground. But by the time we have Market Street here, Market Street has become Commercial Wharf, Market Street Wharf, and all of this, this most darkest and densest area, here's our shoreline continuing up here where my arrow is. That takes it that all of the area to the east of that line is landfill less than four years after the incorporation of the city. Now, as I mentioned, one man, one wheelbarrow, one bucket of sand. I mean, this is an incredible amount of work. Um, and such businesses as Levi Strauss on 300 California Street um, and others uh, that are significant buildings like the uh, bonded liquor warehouse marked as D on Market Street at Fremont, um, these buildings are significant in their stability and contribution uh, to the city at large. As I close up in here, um, we'll start to see the reasoning for uh, the need for toll roads and plank roads, because this will be the first time in 10 minutes that I've uh, mentioned the whole goal. Um, it is at this time, if you want to head west, 
from the grid that we see on this map, you're going to pay a fee or you're going to work hard. Uh, and what I mean by that is up here, we see a road. Down here, we see a road. Over here, we see one trail. And over here, we see another trail. And that's about it. This is a maritime city. People got here by boat. There are no trains, either functioning or created, in many cases even invented for the events here, but there are steam engines and steam patties. Those would be uh, steam shovels and uh, bulldozer type machines with giant steam engines. The idea of a steam donkey uh, is a, a steam engine which was used to log uh, and could also be used to mine. So uh, this is a city that is settled at this time uh, by uh, miners who love to shift the earth and developers who want to um, uh, capitalize. Uh, we see San Francisco's hills are very difficult to exploit. Um, in fact, Telegraph Hill, uh, the entire east side is impassable. And so immediately they start quarrying out the east side of Telegraph Hill and uh, create landfill so that um, where there was once one wharf uh, on Broadway, there are now two more. And by 1857, when we get there, we'll see that there, in fact, are a whole series of wharves. And by 1859, uh, a way to get around the east side of Telegraph Hill. But at this time, getting west is arduous. And there are a couple of reasons why. Um, these hills are monumentous. And the first toll roads uh, to get to where we are, in fact, came from Monterey uh, up the coast and over Twin Peaks and into San Francisco down Corbett or Market Streets, uh, uh, Upper Market as we would call it today. And that was the Corbett Road. And that was a toll road uh, managed by the Spanish to get you to the missions, to get you to the Presidio. And uh, we can see that map uh, on the, excuse me, we can see that road on the last map that I'm going to present um, that actually goes wide enough. But so many of the earlier maps of San Francisco only cover that which is developable or being developed at the time. This is the entire city of San Francisco. It merits pointing out that its title is San Francisco and its vicinity, which really infers that if you are outside of Eddie's plan, which ran from here to here, then you're in the suburbs. You're in the lands that are uh, subject to the Homestead Act and available for squatting and available for development and also within the realm of rancho lands and that these many of these lands are already bestowed upon people as land grants from either the Spanish, the Mexican, or American uh, governance of this area. Um, getting to the toll roads, the first toll road being the Corbett Road coming into town would uh, give us a road over Twin Peaks into San Francisco from the coast. Uh, that would bring you all the way down into the mission. But for San Francisco, uh, the first toll roads for us were in fact the plank roads. And the, the first one is marked on this map. Uh, and we'll just bring its size up just a little bit more uh, so we can get a, an idea of it. And here we see Mission Street. And here we see uh, at the crest of Mission, where this plank road starts, right here is a 60-foot dune, right here is another 60-foot dune, here's an 80-foot dune, here's a 40-foot dune, here's a 50-foot, there's an 80-foot. Um, my point being is this is, um, this is Union Square, and this is a dune field that's two to three times the height of an average building in the town at that time. It's a massive dune field. I only have one or two images that I've ever seen. I, I pulled one up that will get an idea of what that felt like, but it would be cavernous to be at ground level and to be within less than half a block, have it climbed to be 80 feet tall and all of sand. And until this could be removed, the, the dreams of Market Street, a central corridor that would bisect two different surveys with the 50 bar survey at the north and the 100 bar survey at the south, I'm sorry, um, a vara is 33 and a half inches or the equivalent of a Mexican pace. And the majority of mission towns are measured in vara in that they were measured by the Spanish colonialists. Um, with that, then 50 vara 
is 137 and a half feet. So an average city block north of market is 137 by 137 or multiplications thereof. Um, south of market, it would be twice that in each direction, making them four times larger. And this was in part to create for the first time an industrial neighborhood, a scale that could accommodate something larger than human scale because we're actually in an industrial age. We're in the first 20 or 30 years of it, but we're aware of the, the growth in scale and our ability to move things much, much larger than ourselves with much greater ease. So the VARA scale is relevant in that Eddie and Jasper O'Farrell elected to use the VARA and a a uh, 10 and 8 VARA stick was created. It was a pole, and that was used to measure out all of these blocks and physically do the legwork. And that's how survey work was done. So with the VARA working for us here, Market Street was to bisect all of these streets, yet it had these great number of obstacles. So almost immediately, in about 1850, funding was created, and by 1851, the Mission Plank Road was built. And the Mission Plank Road, in fact, is a boardwalk. And we ask, well, why would we ask for a boardwalk to go south of market? It's incredibly flat. It just, you know, what's there that I would need to have an elevation? But when we look closely at this 1853 map of south of market, we actually see a very, very, very different environment than what we might consider uh, flat. Um, we see peaks of up to 60, 20, 40 feet. We see valleys. 15 feet below sea level, and then we see willows, which means water flow, and then we have an anomaly here which most San Franciscans don't even know existed, and I say that because I didn't really understand what this was. This uh, texture area here, which I'm going to blow up just a little bit more, um, is in fact a peat bog, and it runs from what would be 7th Street over here where it's being crossed all the way down to third, and this would be Bluxem right about here. Um, this is an aquifer. This is outflowing fresh water, creating hydro pressure, and blowing the soil out into Mission Bay with tidal influence. Out to Steamboat Boat Point and uh, the Market Street Railway, these are pro rock promontories, uh, one as high as 100 feet that we saw. This was an island on the La Perouse map from 1798. Now it's got um, some land at its base, but this is a peat bog. Peat is an anaerobic organic material. It is material that has decayed and died, excuse me, it has died, and it has fallen into water and fallen into an, envir an environment that has no oxygen. And because of that, it becomes anaerobic. It becomes stable and it becomes um, something, in fact, that the Irish used to burn for heat, right? So, but it, it has all kinds of um, uh, uses in modern industry and gardening and everything else, but it was eight feet thick and underneath it was a lake which could be anywhere from 20 to 80 feet deep. And so <clears throat> this rather banal and innocuous looking gray area with a path across it, um, in fact, at 7th Street, this was the site of the first bridge in San Francisco, and it would be where the federal building is across the street from the 9th District Court of Appeals, the original San Francisco post office. Those buildings were built on the shore of this lake, and the bridge between them uh, was attempted several times, and, and they would dump load after load and put in pilings, put in a 40-foot piling, have it drop, and lose it. Put in another one, try to find it, and lose it. Um, they would dump in yards and yards and yards of material only to come back for the inspector to look and say, there's nothing here to have it washed away. Um, it took an incredible amount of work and the stories in the municipal reports of San Francisco regarding this are just fascinating. Something as a kid who lived south of market in the 80s, I had no idea um, why, uh, for example, uh, 7th Street and 5th Street had humps in them after the earthquake. Well, it's because these were the demarcations of seawalls that were created to contain um, this massive peat bog. And it took uh, decades. It took uh, 20, 40, 60 years. And even today, when they were digging at Fifth and Folsom uh, to create the new building at the site of the old Bill Graham Productions offices and new housing there, they're dumping uh, 1,000 gallons, 1,500 gallons a minute out of the basement into the sewer through a sand trap because that's the Hayes Valley Aquifer. All of the water that goes underground in Hayes Valley comes down and it surfaces right here and goes out into Mission Bay. And even though we built on it, it still exists. 
So this is the reason for a plank road and that we have an undulating dune field that is in fact a peat bog. You can walk across it. In fact, this road right here is a pathway coming from Fifth Street that's well known and discussed in the 1855 Annals of San Francisco as the pathway to get to the first incarnation of Russ's garden. And Russ's garden is these two structures initially, and this is a high point of dry land surrounded by peat bog, and you can see their trails upon it. And these trails, you can walk on the peat bog, but if you put something sharp through it, it'll go right through, and if you put something very heavy, it might eventually just sink five or six feet on top of it. Um, but Russ's garden is well documented, an early family who emigrated out here, in the 1840s, and, uh, and still the Rust Building in San Francisco would be descendants of, of this family. Um, but uh, these uh, lands were uh, uh, precarious and difficult to cross. And so we see some trails, we see some pathways, but in fact, development is very risky. And the only way we can develop them is to build a plank road above it. Um, one of the areas that is very desirable is in fact, the mission. And so the Plank Road goes, and we call it the Mission Plank Road, because it goes down to Center Street. Um, and this is the mission here. Uh, 16th Street dead ends into it. It begins at the Embarcadero. You would uh, generally get here either via the Plank Road or via water coming in on a boat and coming into Mission Creek and down past Jim's Island and here to what was known as Embarcadero, where you disembark and walk down Center Street two or three blocks to the mission where it dead ended. Um, the, all kinds of buildings here relate at this time to the mission and businesses uh, that had popped up after the mission system closed in 1835. All kinds of uh, unsavory activities uh, transpired down here. It was a den of, inequ of inequity. Uh, what was it a den of iniquity? Um, it was a, a debaucherous place. And, uh, and one, uh, one of the things that went on down here is if we, uh, if we close up just a little bit, um, we're getting uh, down there via the Plank Road or we're getting down there via the Turk Street Trail, which is the free way of walking down and not spending money to go on the Plank Road, but you can see it's arduous. But when we get down to the mission, right across the street from it, we have a circle. And through my um, historic mentor, Ken Cathcart, who I've just finished reading, writing some books about, um, uh, Cathcart uh, pointed out in his documentation that this icon had, an, had a meaning and it meant something. And he asked all kinds of people in his notes if they knew what it was. And um, he couldn't get any takers uh, until finally uh, someone mentioned that uh, this was the part of town uh, that at this time where uh, the lands of the mission were still being managed as a cattle ranch and cows still roam free and you still break cattle and there are bear and bull fights for entertainment. And this in fact is a bull ring across the street from the mission on the corner of 16th and Dolores, uh, the site of uh, Catholic school today, I believe. Um, it was gone by 1857. So it's rather uh, unusual, but this was a destination. And these lands down here are warmer. These lands in the mission are flatter. These lands in the mission have fresh water being fed from aquifer and creating lakes, the Laguna de los Dolores at 17th and Folsom right here. It's fed and creates Mission Creek, which goes out to Mission Bay. Um, you have Seguin's Island here. Seguin's Island would be the island uh, uh, the, the automobile island today at the end of 8th Street and the creation of Henry Adams Street. And Mission Creek runs along what would be Division Street, uh, coming off of that and going underneath the freeway, uh, running uh, along uh, and being uh, essentially landfill uh, by the railway to, to take over lands that had no ownership at the time and the removal of the water. But all of this made for very difficult travel. And so in 1853, the only way to get down there was walking the Turk Street Trail or these other trails out west to the San Suchi, out to the Presidio, uh, Presidio Road. And then they started here. So this was pretty um, arduous work. It was something that there was uh, room for 
probabilities of profit. Here's a, a view of Russ's garden from the Annals of San Francisco. Um, this is what it would have looked like on that mound in 1855 in the middle of a peat bog. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to open up was the creation of land and water lots that we saw in that photograph. And here's the map that kind of sells that and sanctions it. And it shows the original shoreline. And then it shows lots being developed outside in that shoreline. Here's the US Marine Hospital. This is the South Beach water property. And so here's Berry Street. This would be uh, where uh, Pack Bell Park is. 50 Berries where I used to get send your money for sea monkeys and Ronco products back in, when I was a kid. Uh, these streets, uh, we still see the names and still see them used. Um, but what we see is an ever-changing shoreline on Brannan Street. We see Folsom, uh, the same thing is happening on the other side in Yerba Buena Cove. And these lands essentially are really under constant pressure. Now, here's a view of the neighborhood from Knob Hill looking east. And the reason I included it is because here we have the south half of Yerba Buena Cove, and we see the north half being developed north of Market. Market Street would run along this shoreline. This is California Street here. This is Sacramento. First toll road on Pacific Ave from 1854 was where the town ended here, and you can see Knob Hill and Russian Hill. Well, this little communique right here, these small hamlet at the edge of town actually became the pathway to the road to get through the mountains and to the other side. So Pacific Avenue, and they, they excavated here and they put in a toll house. And from 1854 to about 1857, you paid for the privilege of going there. Um, here's a view of a plank road, one of the few images. And this in fact is right about at Third and Market, uh, or Third and Mission, excuse me, uh, looking uh, to the west with Twin Peaks in the background uh, and heading down south of Market. And we can see it's anything but level. It's anything but flat. Um, and it's constantly changing. And it's a uh, really um, sand dune country. Uh, this is an 1866 view from the Rumsey Library at Stanford. It's one of the few views that, that shows and gives a sense of the feel. Um, all of this being sand. Uh, sand, sand, sand. Sand is everywhere. And, and sand is everywhere until the 1840s, excuse me, the 1940s, 1950s. So in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, it was a complete and utter sand dune. Um, when we look at something like Mission Creek in 1856, uh, this one was very telling because uh, this was from the surveys of a county surveyor by the name of Hoadley. And here we have Seguin's Island, which I mentioned was the island of 8th Street and land island for cars to drive around today. So this would actually be a roadbed. And 9th Street would be right about here. And what we see is a wharf. And then this was marked as a bridge. And I thought that rather fascinating. And because it was marked as a bridge, I thought, well, what's it connect to? And I had understood that Mission Street had a plank road. Um, and I'd understood that there were toll roads like the Corbett Road and the Pacific Cut. Um, and I understood even, I didn't mention the Lobos Road, um, that's Geary Boulevard um, uh, heading out, uh, starting at about uh, First Ave and going out to Lobos Point uh, and was a toll road from the 1830s on to about the 1860s when trains, uh, trains are the end of this whole conversation because ultimately the development of neighborhoods uh, became something less archaic and less individualized and um, uh, more based in uh, the corporate uh, development of railways and uh, such things. But here we have the 1857 map of San Francisco done also by the U.S. Coast Survey. And I've oriented this one again to accommodate us in that it um, it uh, gives us north at the top, and it orients the same way as the 1853. Uh, in fact, the map was uh, oriented differently, 
and I'm going to rotate it just for kicks uh, because this is the way that you approached San Francisco from 1848 until certainly 1915, if not later. And what I mean by that is that this is a maritime city and everything west in this city is sand dunes and rather unapproachable cliffs. This is a sheltered and leeward side that we had a cove that we're seeing as being filled in that has shelter by high mountains here to create a safe haven, a harbor, if you will, um, protected from the tides and the relentless winds coming from the west. Uh, it is um, definitively maritime and you approach it via these piers and that these are the only piers and the only places to land safely. That means that all business comes in from this direction. Everybody comes to Market Street, everybody comes to Mission Street, everybody's coming in this way. And it's relevant because as we go, and I'll orient this back up again, and we go in, we look by 1857, there is a whole lot more going on. Um, this was the old edge of town and now we have an incredible amount going on out here. And part of the reason for that, of course, is availability of space. And the other reason is that the roads are there. So here we see the Presidio Road developing with agriculture around it. These are ponds. This is Lombard Street and the sand dune along Lombard. This is the lagoon and this is the lagoon survey. So we see this, this part of town, which is bucolic and almost uh, empty, in 1854 is now thriving uh, and is creating food as is Hayes Valley due south down Van Ness Ave is Hayes Valley. Um, by this time they're starting to develop. They're making use of the water that flows through. Any place we see these willows, this icon here where I'm running my cursor is in fact a willow. And these are indicators of either terranean or subterranean water. And these aquifers are well documented. Um, Joel Pomerantz in Seep City spent a lifetime showing us uh, where these waters are today and what's become of them because of course the majority still exist through our backyards and being pumped out of our basements. Um, but nonetheless, these uh, waters are exploitable in that we need water. We live in a sand dune. And so, but we also see the development of South of Market. We see agriculture and cultivated land in South of Market. We see the Hayes Valley Aquifer under Tame. And we actually, when we close in a little more, having looked at a bridge down at 9th Street, I see that in fact, here's Seguins Island and here's a bridge crossing right at about at 9th Street. And this now is a plank road running down Brannan. We also have a plank road running down Folsom. The Folsom plank road was completed by 1854. It was a venture by the same people who did the Mission plank road. It was such a success that they did a second one. It flooded out in the winter of 54, and they lost the section between 4th and 5th Street entirely because the tides of this aquifer here, the tide came in and took those boards away, and uh, they were never seen again. Um, they did rebuild it. Uh, and they, in fact, did the Brandon Street. And at Brandon Street, they started to build seawall and defining Mission Bay. So Mission Bay, we now see as being south of the Brandon Toll Roads, a plank road, and the areas between Folsom and Brandon Street being developed and contained block by block. On this one, as we go in a little bit further, we now see Russ's garden is more formalized. And that picture that I showed before shows the big pavilion and the horse stables and things. And we see it as a much more um, elaborate uh, setup. And we um, also see if I haven't pointed out, every block dot is a confirmed structure. Um, and these trailways feel like our painting. So the, the painting as the backdrop is really so that we can get a sense of what it might feel like to be in this field here, looking up at a 50 foot sand dune, um, surrounded by willow trees, uh, with water flowing around you. And in this case, we can see this right here. These striations mean water. This is still a lake at the corner of like seventh and between Brannan and Folsom. And if we go a little bit further up, to 7th Street and Market, we still have water up here coming across. So we're dealing with a very, very um, transient and very uh, ever-changing 
tidally influenced, wind influenced, erosive, alluvial landscape. There's a marvelous video on YouTube. If you have some time, it's capital here, A-T-R-E-5, and uh, capital letters on the whole thing. Otherwise, you won't find it. It was done by, uh, I believe, by Andrew Lim, Lim Architecture, a uh, Chinese-American, really, really well-researched piece. Um, he used the platform as our, of his architecture firm to do about seven videos about San Francisco, uh, here one through here seven. If you have the time, they're worthy of checking. Uh, they discuss... Um, the south of Market and the toll roads well, but these toll roads essentially were essential to the development of westward expansion from a developing waterfront down into the mission and the flatlands where it was bucolic and flat. It's important to recognize that in a world where everything is um, one man, one wheelbarrow, uh, it's, it's, it's man and mechanical, there are no real engines, and, and if you're rolling barrels, flat ground is safer. If you're stacking barrels, flat ground is safer. If you're boarding horses, flat ground is safer. If you're managing teams and, and wagons, uh, flat ground is safer and easier and more profitable. I don't mean to drive it home, but in the world of real estate, it's about location, location, location. When you look at San Francisco, there weren't a lot of great locations. And lots of times you could come and make a great location. The city would come in and change the height of the road and say, you have to go four feet higher or you have to go four feet lower. Uh, examples of those are things like the Second Street Cut, where we just cut things out, took out 50 feet of, of, of hill in order to accommodate so that animals didn't have to go up and over these hills. It's very difficult for an animal to go up Telegraph Hill. And so they started quarrying it with the expectation of removing it. Um, these toll roads were progress. Uh, they were plank roads built of wood. The wood in these cases, particularly of these, uh, most frequently was redwood as well as dug fir, but redwood available uh, in abundance in Berkeley and in Marin within, because uh, all of the woods that were there and uh, peeled off and, and harvested by the 1860s, well, they were used in great quantity in these type of infrastructural projects. So it's really rather special to see um, this special period because when we get um, a little bit further, we see that the trains pretty much take over. And with the industrial age, um, the idea of walking is still a San Francisco phenomenon. But here we have an 1863 map, which shows all of the rancho lands, and it shows really the first editions of the town. And it shows the Western edition, right? So we have the Fillmore and the Haight over here, and we have Pacific Heights over here. Um, we have the original city and its wards. And then we have Horner's edition. John and Horner, John M. Horner was a, a Mormon who developed uh, what was part of Noe's land grant, uh, the Rancho San Miguel. Uh, Bernal had his rancho. Uh, this is the first map to really show us Bernal Heights. Um, it shows Cecilia Bernal's house here. This is a, a map from a directory, and I wanted to end with it because it, it shows the new San Francisco, and it's a San Francisco where the toll roads aren't quite as important, um, where every road can be a toll road because as they develop, independent train operators, streetcar operators, and entrepreneurs um, are applying. So we see Mr. Hayes, John Hayes, and his brother creating the Hayes Valley, developing the land in 1859, creating a railway that would have taken you to uh, Alamo Square. Uh, Market Street Railway now is, uh, by 1863, they've removed that 80-foot sand dune field down at Third Market, and they've managed to clear a path all the way down to Guerrero and get down to the Willows. The Willows being an undulation, a depression 40 feet deep with fresh water and willow trees and palm trees sheltered from the wind down in the mission. And it was a bucolic place to go and relax and escape the chaos of the city. Um, and it ultimately was the end of the line for the Market Street Railway in 1863. Once you get further out, we see individual homes demarked as well as land grants. We also see the racetracks taking place out here. But this is a world that's now accessed by trains. And from here out, instead of plank road and toll roads, we'll have train systems. And the next talk, we could talk about the over 47 independent train lines that had to be unified to create today's Muni. Uh, and what a consolidation process that was from 1869 all the way till 1934. So thank you for coming today and taking a look at my maps of uh, San Francisco's toll roads and plank roads. Um, 
the landscape presented in the background is from a marvelous painting that I think shows a time of San Francisco and its great bucolic uh, period and, uh, and a period that I think helps me get a sense of the feel when I'm looking at these early survey maps and when they talk about what a sandy road feels like and when they're showing me the Presidio Road, I'm actually having a sense of what it is. So I hope you'll enjoy that. If you have any questions, please reach out to me or to the San Francisco Historical Society. we will be happy to answer those questions. I'm gonna stop share and thank you very much. And thank you, Lana Constant Constantini uh, and uh, all of my friends at SFHS. Uh, uh, it's been marvelous, and I hope to do it again soon. Uh, let's find another subject. Thank you, Jim. It was fabulous. Cool. Thank you. Absolutely. I learned a ton from that. I'm going to stop recording here. Um...